Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us today for a presentation on the Green Blue Deal for the Middle East. My name is Angelique Moss. I'm with the Policy Studies Organization, and I am so happy to introduce Guillaume Broomberg with the Echo Peace uh, Middle East in the Jerusalem office, or I'm sorry, Israel office. Um, Guidon, welcome. How are you? So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present um, uh, this morning in, in the United States or this uh, uh, early evening here in the Middle East. Um, I, uh, I will go through uh, uh, the work of Ecopeace in leading um, this effort of uh, advancing a Green Blue Deal. But first of all, maybe a few words about uh, the organization uh, itself. Um, what is really uh, unique about Ecopeace is that we're a regional organization that brings together Palestinians, Jordanians, and Israelis together. Um, I'm the Israeli uh, director out of our office in Tel Aviv. Um, Nada Majdalani is our Palestinian director out of Ramallah. And Yana Abu Talib is our Jordanian director out of uh, our office in Amman. And uh, our organization is over uh, 27 years old. So uh, we've been doing this for close to three decades, um, where we're really, as our name suggests, we focus on the environment, the echo, um, as a means um, uh, to both advance sustainability, uh, but also, of course, to advance peace. And particularly our vision is a two-state solution, uh, where we would see the state of Israel and the state of Palestine living side by side in an integrated fashion, um, including Jordan and, and other countries in our region, um, uh, because our environment actually knows no borders. Uh, these borders are man-made, and if um, we don't uh, learn how to manage our uh, resources together, um, then uh, as we'll uh, see in a, in a minute, um, the climate crisis um, will threaten our very survival of the strongest and of the weakest. It's like uh, uh, as uh, Nada my Palestinian uh, co-director often says, it's like the Titanic. Um, whether you're up in first class or you're you know, down um, uh, at the bottom of, of the ship, when that uh, uh, iceberg hits, um, we all drown. And uh, that's the situation that, that we're facing uh, here in the Middle East. Um, so I'm gonna sh uh, share uh, my uh, presentation. And this, this presentation, um, has been updated, but um, it starts really with the launch of our report calling for a Green Blue Deal um, uh, a little bit more than a year ago uh, at uh, uh, our annual conference back in uh, December of 2020. And the Green Blue Deal is very much uh, inspired uh, by the efforts of the Biden administration uh, to fight uh, the climate crisis um, in the United States and uh, by the European efforts um, to advance a European Green Deal to fight the climate crisis. And our addition of the word blue um, just really reflects the importance of water issues that are so central um, uh, to uh, both the impacts of climate change on our region and uh, you know, to the survival um, uh, of, of our peoples because of declining precipitation that we can expect. Um, when we launched um, uh, the Green Blue Deal report, it's a report that we authored, um, we really built on uh, about two decades of our work of earlier reports where we brought it all together um, under a climate uh, focus. Um, uh, we, we right, right from the outset, we've had tremendous interest in the Green Blue Deal. As you can see from uh, the speakers uh, uh, just over a year ago, uh, the foreign minister of Finland um, uh, has become a, a real champion of the efforts to create a green blue deal in the Middle East, but um, also you know, leadership in the United States, Dan Shapiro, uh, the former US ambassador to Israel, um, Hadi Amr, uh, currently uh, in charge of the Israel-Palestine desk at the US State Department, you know, spoke uh, on, in, in this year's panel um, and, of course, representatives of our own uh, governments in Israel, in Palestine, and in Jordan. The, uh, the setting here as to you know, why is it so important to 
uh, uh, to deal with the climate crisis is very much uh, due to the setting on the ground. And uh, the map uh, to uh, the left shows uh, the most uh, water scarce parts of the world. And the Middle East and North Africa is the most water insecure part of the world, uh, you know, presently already. Um, it's also an area, sadly, of tremendous conflict. Um, uh, now, there's not a direct relationship between water insecurity and so many of the conflicts, not only Israeli-Palestinian, as you can see, the whole region is full of conflict, but water insecurity is often one of the underlying causes for uh, a conflict in our region. It's often not the main cause, but it, it further contributes to animosity and hatred um, and violence that, that we do see in our troubled part of the world. Um, when, when we then look at the climate crisis and the models of the IPCC, but th in this case, this is a model uh, uh, prepared by Tel Aviv University and a German university. Um, we can see that you know, uh, uh, at the moment um, we have rainfall. The blue represents rainfall um, in the autumn uh, months. By the middle of the century, we will have no rainfall. Um, for those of you that haven't been to the Middle East, <coughs> you, you um, uh, might not know that you know, quite naturally as, as a Mediterranean climate, um, we don't have rain for you know, six, seven, eight months of the year, every year. And when it means that you know, we're gonna lose um, you know, an additional one or two months where uh, uh, there, there was previously rain and now there won't be rain, that has tremendous uh, uh, implications for water security. When we look at, at the forecast uh, for the end of the century, um, what we're seeing is a 50% increase in the summer months uh, and up to 40% reduction in rainfall. Um, you know, the, the Mediterranean Sea uh, last summer, uh, just off the coast of where I live here in Tel Aviv, reached 32 degrees Celsius in the water. Now, that's two degrees Celsius higher than uh, ever on historical record. That, that it really has turned the Mediterranean into nothing more than a hot bath um, by the end of the summer. Um, and uh, as I said, as the most water secure, insecure part of the world, a up to a 40% reduction in rainfall is catastrophic for uh, the lives and livelihoods of, uh, you know, of our peoples, of 450 million people that live in the MENA region. Um, this is my favorite uh, map of Israel, Palestine, Jordan, because it really shows us that the political boundaries are not, are not relevant um, when we talk about you know, sustainably managing our water resources. This is a map of watersheds. And generally, you know, you'd see you know, the green line separating the West Bank and Israel here, and you'd see Gaza um, and Israel border here, and you'd see you know, the border with Jordan. Um, what we're seeing here is the watersheds. And if I look at, at, at this watershed in the center, in Hebrew, we call it the Yarkon watershed. It starts in Ramallah in the West Bank and it ends in Tel Aviv in Israel. And it shows that if we don't manage the water basin um, uh, uh, cooperatively, sustainably, then we don't manage it uh, at all. And, and, and it highlights that cooperation is not doing a favor when it comes to meeting the challenges of the climate crisis. It's an, it's an issue of self-interest and either lose-lose you know, if, we, if we don't manage um, or win-win uh, if we do manage uh, the water resources together. Another example of that, not related to climate change, but more highlighting that you know, if, if a neighbor fails, um, uh, the failure, the implications don't just stop uh, you know, on, on their coast, uh, on, on their side of the border, you know, environmental failures carry and they move with the sea currents in this case or the Mediterranean or, or the groundwater or the streams. And what we're seeing on, on this upper uh, satellite image is um, uh, pollution, uh, uh, raw sewerage or poorly treated sewerage uh, flowing out of Gaza, um, much due to the conflict. This is um, images from 2017 um, uh, at, at, height, uh, at the height of conflict between Israel and Gaza, um, uh, where um, uh, we see that 
uh, you know, the sewerage is not only, you know, polluting uh, the beaches uh, of Gaza, where there are 2 million Palestinians, um, but it's carried by the currents also to the Israeli beaches directly north of Gaza. And uh, the work of Ecopeace highlighted that um, one of Israel's desalination plants in Ashkelon, which is just seven kilometers north of Gaza, uh, was having to close intermittently um, because the sewerage was coming into the pipes that would take the seawater to the desalination plant. And of course, no one wants to desalinate, turn um, uh, seawater to drinking water when the seawater is so polluted by sewerage. And by releasing that information uh, to the environment, uh, to, to the public, sorry, um, by releasing the information of the closure of the Ashkelon desalination plant, and people need to understand that you know, in Israel, over 70% of the water that we drink is coming from you know, one of, uh, of these five desalination plants along the Mediterranean coast. Um, and by shutting down one of the, the desalination plants, that shuts down. 15% of the country's drinking water. And that brings home the message that, you know, a failure to treat sewage in Gaza has direct implications for water security and national security for Israel. And then for when we ask, well, why, uh, you know, is, is, is sewage not being treated and the conflict issues uh, are rampant, then it, it highlights that, you know, it's not only military conflict that we need to be dealing with, it's human it's not only military security issues, it's human security issues um, that we need to approach and resolve if we're um, uh, uh, going to manage uh, you know, uh, our environment and our water resources uh, together. Um, so moving forward uh, for the Green Blue Deal, um, uh, you know, given this uh, climate setting of interdependency, um, of reduced precipitation, of, redu of increased temperatures, um, of having to meet uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the commitments um, of the international community, and particularly you know, the, the, the Paris Climate Accords, um, we're focused on four pillars, um, uh, which are, uh, are actions that you know, we've uh, proposed and put on the table to move forward to try and build climate resilience in our region. And the first pillar, which I'm presenting now, um, is really uh, you know, built on the experience of the European Coal and Steel Agreement, uh, a, a, an effort um, uh, uh, that was based on uh, the two most important um, natural resources of the European continent last century, uh, you know, uh, right after the, the Second World War. Um, mostly uh, uh, led by uh, uh, France and Germany with the support of the United States, that, uh, that Europe start to cooperate on uh, those two critical natural resources, coal and steel, rather than compete, um, to make sure that you know, a war would be unimaginable. Um, because of course, coal and steel are also the engines, not only of the economy uh, of Europe at the time, uh, but also of warfare. Um, and we asked uh, uh, in our own uh, research, um, excuse me, uh, we asked uh, through our own research, well, what uh, is the coal and steel um, that's relevant to the Levant, to the Eastern Mediterranean, Middle East um, at this time? And our research concluded um, that it's uh, uh, the need to harness the sun um, in order to produce renewable energies, um, uh, in order to meet, uh, you know, uh, uh, the target of, of no more than a global average of one and a half degree uh, uh, Celsius increase in temperatures. And uh, the challenge that the climate crisis is presenting in uh, water security uh, by desalinating uh, seawater. So um, in our study, you know, we looked at, well, is the modern day coal and steel relevant to the Middle East, harnessing the sun and harnessing the sea? And our study showed very much so, that not only are, they, are these the two most important natural resources for climate resilience in our region, but um, uh, the way that uh, our countries are situated, um, the different countries have 
comparative advantages in harnessing those natural resources. And Jordan, uh, you know, to the east has the comparative advantage of having vast desert areas. For those of you that are, that are familiar with the Middle East, Jordan has expansive territory um, where it's able, it's already a, a regional leader where 20% of its renewable, where 20% of its electricity is coming from renewable energy, more, much more than uh, Israel and Palestine have been able to achieve. And that's largely due to the fact that it has tremendous expanse of territory. And therefore it's able to uh, produce large scale renewable, both at very attractive prices, cheaper uh, than in Israel and Palestine, and at scale that, uh, that, that um, uh, is, is much, much larger. Um, Israel, uh, if you look at the map, has the Negev here, but the Negev is actually captured. The Negev is half military training areas and the other half are declared nature reserves. And the lack of land is, is actually the main reason why um, Israel is only at about 9% uh, renewables compared to Jordan, 20%. And when it comes to uh, Palestine, you know, Gaza and the West Bank, well, you know, uh, the fact that Israel controls uh, uh, area C, which is 60% of the West Bank, has been a tremendously limiting factor, although something that we're advocating for, that the Palestinians be able to invest um, uh, in area C for renewables. Um, on the other hand, um, both Israel and Palestine al along the Gaza coast have the comparative advantage of uh, 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 being on the Mediterranean, uh, which is no more than 100 kilometers from all of the major population centers. Um, and particularly, if we, if we look from Tel Aviv to Amman, the capital of Jordan, it, it's about 100 kilometers. Um, but also Jordan's second largest city, Irbid, you know, uh, 100 kilometers north of Amman, remains 100 kilometers for, uh, roughly from the Mediterranean coast. And that means that the Mediterranean is in closest proximity um, and desalinating on the Mediterranean coast, whether in Gaza or in Israel, um, enables you to move large quantities of water um, from the west to the east at shortest distances, which means at, uh, in the end at cheapest uh, prices, um, which is significant because you know, desalination is still uh, more expensive than natural water. Jordan does have a coast in Aqaba down here in the south, but that's 300 kilometers from Amman, the capital of Jordan, 400 kilometers from Irbid, the second city, and that's double or triple the cost so what, what we've shown here is that we can create through harnessing the sun and the sea, healthy interdependencies, where for the very first time, each side, Israelis and Palestinians would have the comparative advantage to sell water um, to meet uh, all countries uh, and needs. And, and Jordan uh, could sell large scale uh, renewable energy. Um, and in that way, we can achieve region-wide water security and region-wide energy security and bring regional stability. Because uh, as I said, for the first time, every side would have something to buy and every side would have something uh, to sell. Now, um, as some of you uh, 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 might have uh, you know, seen in the press late last year, an agreement was actually signed. And, and this idea of EcoPeace to create a water energy exchange um, was actually translated uh, into uh, an intergovernmental decision or, or a declaration of intent that was signed by the governments of Israel and Jordan um, uh, with financing from the European, uh, from the uh, UAE and uh, under the auspices of, of US Secretary um, and uh, Climate Envoy uh, Kerry um, uh, with uh, 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 teams are now uh, working um, in Israel and in Jordan to move forward on the implementation on the one hand um, of, of, uh, of building a very large uh, uh, solar field in the southern part of Jordan with a dedicated line that would cross uh, to Israel to bring uh, renewable energy, utilize the renewable energy to desalinate uh, on the Mediterranean and bring water back to Jordan. Um, unfortunately, uh, Palestine was not part of the declaration of intent uh, on this occasion, um, much due to the fact that, that Jordan and the West Bank <coughs> already have 
a connection, electricity connection um, uh, between uh, the Jordanian side and, and uh, the Palestinian city of Jericho with plans to further expand that. Uh, but as I said, we're hopeful uh, that, that we're going to see um, investments where uh, uh, Palestinians will be able to invest, particularly um, in the uh, southern part of the West Bank, uh, where the uh, radiation uh, levels are the best, um, uh, including uh, hopefully for the purposes of, of uh, uh, providing electricity for the desalination plants that are proposed in Gaza. So already one of the uh, four pillars of the Green Blue Deal um, have, have already been um, uh, 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 you know, is moving forward. And this is, you know, potentially a $7 billion investment program. And the government of Israel and the government of Jordan both declared that, that this agreement is the most important agreement that was uh, signed by the two governments since the signing of the peace treaty um, uh, because of the size of the investments and the importance uh, of the issue to climate resilience. You need to understand that um, uh, the water crisis in Jordan is so severe. Um, uh, water is supplied uh, in Jordan's capital uh, here um, uh, in, um, in the Amman area um, just eight hours a week. Um, I, I think that's sort of unimaginable to an American audience that you know, when you turn on the tap, um, you, don't, you can't always expect water to flow. You know, the municipality throughout, in fact, uh, Jordan, uh, uh, the West Bank and Gaza, but also Lebanon, Syria, much of the region here, water is intermittently supplied. The municipality is able to supply water to a neighborhood once a week, once every two weeks. It means that on every home, there is a water canister and when the municipality supplies the water, that's the day you do all your washing, your cleaning, um, uh, you know, meet the needs of, of, of uh, garden or, or any uh, local agriculture um, and store as much, by the end of the day, store as much water as you can because you might not see water um, uh, again for another week, another two weeks. Um, you know, people are not dying of thirst but um, they're, ha they're having to buy if they've run out of water, which is very common. Uh, you, th you then need to order a water tank, a water tanker um, that would come and um, uh, could, could fill your tank. Uh, but the, the cost of that water can be 10 to 20 times the cost of municipal water. And it's really not affordable to most of the poor families. So that you know, the situation in Jordan is so severe that it's only getting water at the moment for uh, eight hours a week, and without this type of uh, deal, um, uh, you know, th this cooperation moving forward, water supply to the capital um, would have been cut to once every two weeks and, and even less. Um, so this is not a, an issue of doing a favor. And similarly, on the Israeli side, um, buying the renewable energy from the Jordanians is not doing a favor to Jordan. It's it's buying it because Israel doesn't have the land to meet its own commitments to, to Paris. And Israel wants uh, to meet its commitments of 30% uh, renewables by the end of this decade and 100% renewable by the end of the century. And it's, uh, you know, uh, the efforts of Ecopeace were able to bring to the decision makers in both Israel and Jordan that if we're going to meet the challenges of, of the climate crisis, we're going to have to uh, cooper cooperate whether we like each other or not. But our worldview is that once we start to cooperate, you know, we break down barriers, we create common interests. And through those common interests, we can build uh, uh, you know, long-term peace, not only, of course, between Israel and Jordan, where there's a peace treaty, although a cold peace, uh, but, but uh, also between uh, Israel and Palestine. Um, the second uh, uh, pillar uh, of the uh, Green Blue Deal um, then relates to uh, rehabilitating the River Jordan. Uh, for those that don't know where the River Jordan is, um, it starts uh, in uh, the north of Israel. Um, uh, one of the tributaries come from uh, Syria, one of the tributaries come from Lebanon, and the third tributary is from Israel. And then it, uh, they combine at the Hula Valley, 
and then uh, the upper Jordan flows in to the famous Sea of Galilee. It's actually just a lake, it's a rather small lake, in fact. Um, and then would naturally, uh, the Jordan River, and, and perhaps the most famous part of the river, um, uh, flows out of the Sea of Galilee and makes its way down to the Dead Sea. Now, this is a, a river holy to half of humanity, to the three Abrahamic faiths. This, this is the place down here in the south opposite Jericho in the West Bank, where Jesus is baptized. Um, so for Christians, the third most holiest Christian site. For Jews, uh, the river um, is a place of miracles where you know, uh, the river parrots and the Israelites cross to the promised land. Um, and for Muslims, four of the companions to the prophet Muhammad are buried along uh, the eastern banks of this river. Yet, despite the importance of the river to our respective peoples and religions, the conflict managed to turn the Jordan River into little more than a sewage canal, where you know, Israel was first in blocking uh, the exit of the Sea of Galilee, because the river uh, from here becomes the border. And in a conflict mindset, allowing fresh water to flow down the border empowers your enemy. Um, uh, therefore, the water was basically stopped uh, uh, flowing out of the Sea of Galilee. And then Syria um, builds about 40 dams on the Yarmouk and its various tributaries to capture as much water for her own uh, needs and prevent it flowing into the river. And then Jordan does the same. And the result is that 95% of the water that used to flow here has been diverted, half by Israel and the other half by Syria and Jordan. And instead of fresh water, we have a lot of sewage and um, flowing down the river. So the river stinks. You know, the river can smell. The river um, has lost 50% of its biodiversity. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the livelihoods of communities, uh, but, you know, and, and in this case, on the Palestinian side, um, there's now no access to the river at all. Um, uh, uh, and even if there was, the water quality here is so bad that it can't be utilized. Um, what our, uh, uh, the, the implication of the water energy exchange of moving uh, uh, water east gives us the possibility to rehabilitate the River Jordan again. And this is basically due to the fact that um, um, Israel has just completed spending a billion uh, shekels on reversing its national water carrier. Um, what does that mean? Well, in the uh, 50s and 60s, um, you know, Israel, as I said, blocked uh, the outlet of the Sea of Galilee and built a set of uh, canals and pipes that pump water out of the Sea of Galilee up here in the north um, uh, to the center of the country, Tel Aviv and where I live in the center of the country, but also to agriculture in the south. And we're, we're talking about, you know, in its heyday, about 500 million cubic meters of water. But because of climate change, we've seen a dramatic reduction in the amount of rainfall here in the north. And just four years ago, the Sea of Galilee was so low um, uh, because of a reduction of 15 years of drought uh, over the last 25 years, uh, over the last 20 years. Um, uh, the Sea of Galilee was so low that it, it was uh, uh, threatening to turn into a saline lake. So rather than continuing to pump water out, Israel spent about a billion shekels um, uh, to lay a, a parallel pipe and put pumping stations that uh, would uh, move water to the Sea of Galilee, connecting the national water carrier to these blue uh, uh, dots that represent uh, uh, desalination plants. So this is the Ashkelon desalination plant that I mentioned before next to Gaza, but there's four other existing desalination plants that, as I said, produce 70, close to 80% of the drinking water, of the water supply um, in Israel with more plans. And th this is the next desalination plant that will come on board. And what the plans are is to connect the desalination plants with uh, the national water carrier to be able to move uh, water to the Sea of Galilee. Um, in the first stage, 120 million cubic meters, second stage, 300 million cubic meters. And um, uh, in, the, in the water uh, deal signed between Israel and Jordan, that creates the possibility um, to, to move uh, that water through the national water carrier also to the Sea of Galilee. 
And instead of uh, what at the moment, there's a pipe connecting, and you can see it here, connecting the Sea of Galilee across the border. The border is the Yarmouk River in this case, to the King Abdallah Canal, which is just an open canal actually you know, uh, modeled on um, the Tennessee Valley uh, canal uh, systems in the United States. Um, uh, so, so Israel currently, as part of the, the peace treaty, before this water uh, energy exchange that was just signed, um, as part of the peace treaty, Israel supplies Jordan uh, with its fair share of the Jordan River, about 55 million cubic meters, coming from the Sea of Galilee into the King Abdullah Canal. Now, um, uh, and, and not flowing into the Jordan. And, and our proposal, um, and that's the second pillar of the Green Blue Deal, um, is to uh, clean up the river, is to remove the sewage that is currently flowing in the river, mostly from uh, Jordanian and Palestinian communities and agriculture and fish farm waste that's coming from the Israeli side. So that instead of using a pipe to supply uh, the water to Jordan, um, uh, to use the natural, water carrier, which is the river itself, and allow large quantities of water to flow down the, the, the River Jordan as uh, uh, south of the baptism site, so south of the area opposite Jericho. And instead of what is uh, currently, there's a pipe taking the water from the King Abdullah uh, uh, Canal to Amman, Jordan's capital, um, uh, to move it uh, instead from the river further south, so that we can re rehabilitate nine tenths of the River Jordan. And by doing that, uh, we, we can bring back the 50% of the biodiversity um, that we've lost uh, because of the demise of the river. But we also create new economic opportunities for Jordanian, Palestinian, and Israeli communities along uh, in the Jordan Valley. Uh, because with the climate crisis having uh, you know, uh, less precipitation, um, uh, less water means less agriculture. And that is the main livelihood of the 600,000 uh, Jordanians that live here in the valley, the 60,000 Palestinians in the valley and the 30,000 Israelis. Um, we need to diversify income sources away from just agriculture. And of course, a rehabilitated river uh, brings uh, tremendous potential for tourism and particularly for pilgrimage. Um, presently, there's only about a million Christian pilgrims that come to be baptized in the Jordan River. And that's largely due to the fact that the river is, is so demised. And our own studies showed that we can increase that tenfold um, and produce new economic opportunities for all residents if we rehabilitate uh, the river. Um, and that's, that's based on another research project that Equipeace did uh, with the support of the European Union. Uh, the very first integrated master plan for the Jordan Valley. This is what the Jordan River currently looks like. Not very attractive. There's no flow. And this is a 2000 year old Roman bridge. It still stands across the, uh, uh, the River Jordan. Um, and, and as I said, uh, we then expand uh, economic opportunities. And instead of a, a $4 billion economy, uh, which is the economy of the Jordan Valley on all sides, at the moment, we can move to a $73 billion economy if we can rehabilitate uh, the river. The third chapter of the Green Blue Deal is about um, uh, creating uh, water resilience and um, particularly in the Israeli-Palestinian context. Um, I need to give a little bit of background here because uh, uh, when uh, you know, the Oslo Accords were signed, which is the key agreement uh, uh, between Israel and the PLO, uh, when they were signed in 95, um, there was only natural water. And, and that's the coastal aquifer, um, which is shared between Israel and Gaza, the mountain aquifer shared between uh, Israel and the West Bank and the Jordan River system. Um, there was no desalination at that time because desalination um, in other parts of the world was costing $2 a cubic meter. Um, it's now down to 40 cents. Um, but, but in 95, desalination was seen as too expensive. And, and therefore, um, when uh, the Oslo Accords were negotiated, uh, sharing the natural water um, uh, between you know, Israel and the West Bank and, and Israel and Gaza was seen as a difficult thing to do uh, because you know, any movement of, because water was being 
was 100% utilized. And uh, any uh, uh, water that would, uh, would be supplied uh, to Palestine would mean less water for, is for Israel, and particularly for Israeli farmers. So, so it was a, a win-lose situation, a hard thing always to resolve. And therefore, water was put aside as a difficult issue to solve, together with the other four difficult issues, Jerusalem, and settlements, refugees, and uh, borders and security. Um, uh, the idea being that within five years, um, a deal would be struck, and these five difficult issues would be resolved together. Um, and specifically, the idea was Israel would be so-called generous on water, and Palestine would be so-called generous on refugees. And so sort of that was the way the deal was going to be um, uh, struck. Uh, but as sadly as we all know, um, uh, a deal is never a final agreement um, has never uh, uh, moved forward um, and we've failed. Our governments have failed uh, to reach agreement on these five final status issues, even though uh, today uh, water is no longer a difficult issue to resolve. And that's, as I said earlier, much due to, in this case, Israeli leadership in um, developing desalination technology at um, a tremendously reduced costs, um, as well as uh, leadership on treating sewage water um, as another source of manufactured water. So that the water pie today is no longer natural water. It's, it's natural water and desalinated water and treated wastewater all together. So the water pie has increased tremendously, which means that today Palestinians can uh, and need to uh, receive their fair share of particularly the mountain aquifer um, uh, that, that is, the, is the best quality water in the region. Um, uh, and, and they can increase their pumping of that aquifer, which means that Israel would have to decrease uh, its pumping of the aquifer, otherwise we damage the aquifer. But now that decreased water supply can be replaced at competitive prices by increased desalination by Israel on the Mediterranean. Yet, even though water is completely resolvable and we shouldn't um, uh, uh, need to see intermittent water supply, as I said, there's intermittent water supply all over the region. Um, in the southern part of the, of the West Bank, it's, it, it's even you know, uh, worse than, than most other areas in the region. Uh, the, uh, a city like Yatta, um, uh, which is 110,000 people, uh, Palestinians, um, gets you know, water in the summertime once a month, once every two months. Um, uh, you know, people are dependent on buying water uh, from tankers every week uh, at very expensive prices. Um, uh, but the main reason, sadly, as to why moving forward on water has not happened is because the paradigm of our own governments of the government of Israel, but also the Palestinian Authority and the international community has been, you know, since 1994, that either we agree on all five final status issues together, or we don't agree on anything and we don't move forward on anything. And in that sense, at Equipeace, we see, you know, this paradigm, this man-made paradigm as resulting in water issues being held hostage, um, uh, uh, you know, to the, the difficulty of resolving you know, issues like Jerusalem. Um, and, and we see this as, as having uh, uh, tremendous implications for uh, the failure uh, to uh, you know, resolve conflict because you know, uh, both the Israeli public and the Palestinian public have seen no progress in, uh, uh, in real peace, uh, in final peace negotiations for the last three decades. And uh, you know, with no progress, it's no wonder that the public has no faith that there'll ever be peace, um, is left only with increased animosity and hatred because no one has seen progress on any issue. And that's much due to the fact that the paradigm, the political paradigm that we've created, that we must solve everything or we don't move forward on anything, has helped create. And um, so we think that we can break through um, uh, this paradigm and at least resolve immediately the water issues, which would mean Palestinians achieving their 
uh, water rights, which would mean more water in every Palestinian home. There's a pipe um, connecting water to people's homes, but there just isn't water flowing um, you know, 24 seven or anywhere near that um, into those homes. And we can tremendously improve uh, that situation um, so that, whoops, so that we no longer see um, you know, the water insecurity, the intermittent supplies. This is in the West Bank, the typical, this is a school. Uh, this is a school, uh, it's, a, it's a girl's school um, uh, where, where you're seeing a water tank and, and uh, the girls are cleaning the tank to make sure that you know, the water stored uh, remains healthy. Um, uh, this is a water tanker, you know, uh, uh, supplying water in a, a, a more uh, Bedouin uh, uh, community in the West Bank. Um, and this is Gaza, which is in the most serious situation because um, uh, the groundwater of Gaza is so uh, over pumped um, that, it, that salinity levels and pollution levels are so high that 97% of the drinking water of Gaza um, can, is no longer groundwater. Or, or sorry, 97% 90 of the groundwater of Gaza is no longer drinkable. And people are having to um, uh, be dependent on filling jerry cans from, from small desalination plants in Gaza to meet their drinking needs. We shouldn't need to see this situation at all. We, we can uh, resolve this and improve the water reality in every Palestinian home. We can uh, create confidence by moving forward on one of the core issues of the peace process, which basically can pull the rug of those that, um, uh, uh, that deny that there's a partner uh, uh, to advance the two-state solution, we come and say, no, this is evidence that we can uh, come to agreement uh, on final status issues. And if we can do that on one final status issue, such as, such as water, there's no reason why we wouldn't be able to do that uh, for the other final status issues as well. And for the Israeli side, um, uh, uh, a key issue of concern is sewage. And what we're seeing here is mostly Palestinian sewage, also some from Israeli settlements, Ariel, but this is mostly Palestinian sewage um, uh, where sewage is not being properly treated, also um, for conflict issues and internal management issues and finance issues um, that is leading to um, uh, polluting uh, uh, the, the scarce natural water resources and, and, and all the streams. And you know most of the streams that, um, uh, uh, that flow west, of course, flow into Israel. Um, so, you know, this is a further issue of animosity um, uh, between Israelis and Palestinians that has been left unresolved. Um, another example of, of, of the need to be working together on water issues and changing our management structures um, is uh, early warning, you know, flood prevention. Um, you know, what we're seeing here is, uh, you know, the water basin shared between the Negev and Gaza, and this is Wadi Gaza. You know, this is the, the border between Israel and Gaza. Um, most of the watershed um, of Wadi Gaza is in Israel. Um, uh, uh, because of climate change, um, we're seeing uh, less rainfall, but when it does rain, it's far more intense and it leads to floods. This is um, uh, Gaza City this winter, completely flooded. Um, and this is uh, you, know, uh, you know, very much due to climate change, but we can prepare ourselves and manage and prevent um, uh, the loss of life in particular um, if we uh, manage the watershed together, as I sort of highlighted on my, uh, in, in one of the first uh, slides, but we, but we can only do that uh, if we cooperate. And uh, at Equipeace, we're trying to move forward on an early warning flood system. Um, uh, and not only between Israel and Gaza, but between Israel and the West Bank as well, you know, al along the whole, the whole coast, um, increasingly needed. The fourth and final pillar um, of the Green Blue Deal is focused on education. And uh, it's really um, uh, uh, focused on uh, you know, the work of Ecopeace over these last three decades. Um, uh, these are uh, Palestinian, Jordanian, and Israeli youth. Um, they're high school kids, and uh, they're spending uh, a year together um, in parallel and, and in joint meetings, learning about 
their water reality and their neighbor's water reality. And the interconnection uh, uh, between the two, um, uh, understanding as we've shown in all the slides, that we're dependent on each other, whether we like it or not, that the water resources cross um, uh, the boundaries, both fresh water and sanitation. And that if we're gonna uh, survive um, the climate crisis, we're gonna have to learn skills of water diplomacy and, and, and better understand um, uh, what the climate crisis means for our region. Um, this type of uh, uh, youth leadership um, uh, where you know, the youth undertake projects and call upon their mayors um, to solve uh, critical water issues leads to activities such as this. These are the mayors of the Jordan River. Again, Palestinian, Jordanian, and Israeli um, jumping into a clean stretch of the Jordan River uh, uh, here in, in the northern part of the river, not because they're best friends, but, but they've come to understand that just south of here, the demise of the river is at their loss. And they're, they're all losers, that they've lost um, uh, uh, particularly economic opportunities for their residents who live in poverty. And that the only way that they can rehabilitate the river is to answer the call of the youth and uh, to work together uh, to, to remove the sewage and uh, to allow fresh water to flow. Um, and this type of water diplomacy um, uh, uh, climate education that at Ecopeace we lead in schools in Palestine, in Jordan, and Israel, and with young professionals um, uh, uh, across the region, uh, need, really needs to be mainstreamed. And, and we need to see that you know, that this is this become integrated into our education system, so that every uh, uh, young person in our region is learning about these issues and and helping to create the type of political will. Um, uh, that we need uh, to, uh, to survive um, uh, uh, the climate crisis. Um, uh, at, you know, at Ecopeace, this is Gaza, the school in Gaza, where uh, through international support, we've built some solar facilities and gray water reuse and you know, 2000 Palestinian kids in Gaza are learning about um, water scarcity issues and the climate crisis and uh, uh, you know, the need uh, uh, to work across border um, uh, to solve these issues. And finally, this is a echo park that Ecopeace has built in Jordan with the support of the government of Jordan, um, uh, where we've planted about 40,000 trees um, and, and built accommodation centers and meeting uh, rooms where we bring many of the youth from our region to learn together about the, sh the shared nature and, and, and the shared response uh, required. Um, finally, um, you know, our efforts to uh, communicate the Green Blue Deal has brought tremendous attention. Um, this is uh, Nada, the Palestinian director of Ecopeace. This is Yana, the Jordanian director, and this is myself. And here we're, we're at the invitation of, of the then German president of the UN Security Council. And this, this photo was taken two years ago, just in uh, January. Um, uh, we were invited again uh, to the UN Security Council uh, where we specifically presented the Green Blue Deal um, as an example of why climate and security issues need to be one of the uh, core issues of the UN Security Council, that, that the climate crisis is a threat uh, to global security, to uh, peace and security in the Middle East. But if we cooperate, it can be a source of peace. It can be a source of of economic development and climate resilience. And that was our message uh, to the UN Security Council. And this is, um, again, our team uh, together with the Foreign Minister of Finland, um, who's been championing uh, the Green Blue Deal. This is uh, during uh, the Secretary General's Climate Summit uh, that, that uh, took place um, uh, over uh, a year ago. Um, so um, that's um, you know basically uh, the presentation that I I wanted to uh, go through. I'd be delighted to answer any questions um, that, uh, that anyone might uh, have to clarify um, any, uh, any further points. I think we only have like 10 minutes left, if that's correct. Um, so back to you, Angelique. Yeah, 
yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. You know, I found it very interesting and I started thinking about, yeah, just the, what I've seen travel on my different travels and news reports and I'm surprised, I guess, with everything else going on, you know, we don't hear that much about it. And just like three of the four pillars you mentioned really do deal with, you know, the water insecurity and that really needs to be fixed. And I was surprised to hear about, yeah, all the different siphoning off from the Jordan River, um, but then also the opportunities that are there for ecotourism. So you had mentioned, you know, that would be, you know, a definite benefit for those communities. I was really excited also hear about Echo Park in Jordan. Uh, what are some other maybe ecotourism opportunities Opportunities that will help towards these four pillars that Echo Peace is, you know, really striving for. So, so you know, our, our, our region, um, you know, under every stone is thousands of years of history, um, and you know, you know, the river. I, I don't think there's a child on earth that hasn't heard of the River Jordan, but they would be shocked if they would come today to the region, and you know. You know, it was never the Mississippi, let's put it that way, but you know, it was 100 meters wide. It was a fast flowing river. In, in fact, I love this story. The first um, Westerner that uh, uh, traveled down the Jordan River was uh, an officer of the US Navy. His name was Lynch. And he came down, he convinced the US Navy in the 1850s that for American security, it's important to, you know, to discover the Jordan River and, and to be the first to take a boat from the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea. Of course, it was nothing to do with American security. It was because you know, he was a religious Christian and he wanted to, you know, to explore that river uh, for, for the benefit of, 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 uh, of humanity. Um, now, uh, Lynch, when he traveled down the Jordan River, he, he took four boats. He lost one of the boats that crashed on a waterfall in the Jordan River. Today, a mouse wheel will not turn. The flow is just so pathetic with 95% of its waters diverted um, that you know, uh, there's no waterfalls in the Jordan River. And as I said, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a real uh, uh, environmental, geopolitical and economic loss. Um, so, so we're today in the position um, and we think that um, this is an issue. Um, that the international community can really get behind, um, that would expand uh, 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 the economic opportunities, um, would be something very concrete uh, to work, uh, uh, you know, to have Palestinians and Jordanians and Israelis not only work together, but also uh, uh, gain benefit uh, from the river, all three. I mean, that's critical. And, uh, and we think that's, that, that's an example of, of how we can advance peace. And it really also speaks to, uh, you know, I, I, I saw one of the other sessions um, um, in this conference was also dealing with um, a confederation, an idea of, of creating an Israeli, Palestinian, Jordanian confederation. And from an environmental perspective, there's no doubt that's what we need. You know, wh whether a, a political confederation is formally created or not, from an environmental management perspective, we must have a confederation. We must uh, be working together um, uh, uh, to manage uh, these uh, shared resources because these political lines um, are just man-made and, and they, they in fact get in the way uh, for uh, uh, nature and people. And, and perhaps you know, the experience of Ecopeace you know, we, we haven't done very well in uh, sharing uh, any real care for the other, for the other side. Perhaps if we can learn together to care for nature, uh, you know, to bring back the River Jordan, to, to take out the sewage from all the cross-border streams, perhaps if we can, you know, uh, make peace with nature, we'll also learn how to make peace with each other. And, uh, and, that, and that's our hope. And, and that's what we see, um, you know, particularly through the young people. You know, people often speak of, of, the, of the wonderful Swedish activist, uh, Greta Thornburg, um, uh, you know, a young, a, a young woman um, that, that has really brought that passion to the global stage. Well, I'm, I'm, in our work, I'm so inspired every day 
because we have our Palestinian, our Jordanian, and our Israeli Greta Thornburgs that are vocal, that are out there, and that are coming together and calling on our respective governments to pull their heads out of the sand. These are issues that can't wait. Failure to move forward on climate resilience is failure of continued survival here in the Middle East, of great concern to our own peoples, but equally to the broader uh, community. Because if we fail, you know, we're gonna see 400, 450 million people having to move because we're not gonna be able to continue to, uh, to live um, in our uh, uh, troubled uh, region with, uh, uh, if we can't build the climate resilience needed. No, I think that's why very well said that the fourth pillar is so important to education because I think the kids being able to see why, you know, their lives are this way, why this is the status quo and knowing that, you know, there can be things that can be done to change the situation. You know, you shouldn't have, you know, eight hours a week of water in Amman. And so if they knew everything that went into it, like, no, we need to, you know, you know, contact our mayors, contact our politicians um, and really see, you know, how we can make this better because we don't want to continue on this way. So. I'm so excited to hear that you do have those activists and that that is an actual pillar. Another thing I wanted to ask uh, for our last question, um, if no one else again has any questions, is, you know, there's so many hurdles, <laughs> you know, with the work that Echo Peace is trying to do. What would you say is like that lowest hanging fruit? What's like the smallest hurdle that, you know, that you see Echo Peace really making a change in in the next few years? So, so uh, I mean, I, I think we're seeing uh, uh, the change through uh, adopting and emphasizing the climate narrative. Um, you know, we've been around for three decades, but it's really only in this last decade, and in, in perhaps it really only in this last six, seven years, where we've really uh, highlighted because the evidence um, has been has been so dramatic that the climate crisis threatens our very survival, and and. Um, we've seen that uh, by approaching peace building through the climate lens, we've been able to reduce uh, some of the levels of animosity. Um, it, it, everything remains, of course, highly political, but, but, but the levels of animosity, the understanding that we're in the same boat is so much stronger that, you know, uh, you know uh, unfortunately, so much of peace building is seen that, oh, you know, it's only the other side that's going to benefit and my side's not going to benefit. Well, under the climate crisis, either we all survive or, or, or none of us survive. And, and that is today uh, the opportunity. The Biden administration and, and Secretary Kerry is really showing the type of global leadership. And, and you know, we pray for peace in, in Ukraine, um, uh, uh, for the people of Ukraine, but also to make sure that we don't lose sight uh, of the need to continue to work uh, on, you know, meeting the challenge of the climate crisis, because, uh, because you know, as tension is taken away, uh, quite understandably, um, from you know the climate issues to, you know, to the terrible you know loss of life in in the Ukraine, um, uh, you know, we can't we can't afford to lose political momentum. Um, the next uh, uh, summit. Uh, on uh, uh, the conference of the, on the parties of climate will take place here in the region, in Egypt, um, in November. Um, uh, uh, that's a that's another opportunity that we're hoping that we might, you know, like uh, uh, at the beginning of the year we saw the water energy uh, deal signed. We're crossing our fingers that we might see the first steps of a trilateral effort um, uh, on the River Jordan. Uh, between Palestine, Jordan, and Israel. Yes, 
That would be excellent. And then, yeah, being able to have that attention brought, you know, to the region with that conference being in Egypt, I think will definitely um, help push that agenda. So I'm really excited. It's been really great hearing about this and all the great work that Echo Peace is doing. And um, I just want to say if you have any last words for our audience, uh, thank you so much, Dino. So, so my, my only last uh, uh, suggestion is um, if you're interested to follow up, um, please visit our website, uh, echopeaceme.org, and our Green Blue Deal uh, uh, efforts is uh, on the front page, on the home page of, of that website. You can subscribe to our newsletter. Um, uh, we have a whole set of actions that you can help us advance um, uh, to help advance the Green Blue Deal for the Middle East. Yes, thank you so much. Shukran to Dava. Thank you very much. Good night. Have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Good night and a good day there in the U.S. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.